Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Sebastian Couture, and I'm here with Frederike Ernst. Today, we're speaking with Munir Benchemled. He's the founder of Paraswap. They're a DEX aggregator, and they aggregate more than 20 decentralized exchanges and AMMs. Before we talk to Munir, though, we'd like to tell you about our sponsors for today's episode. Gnosis Safe is a smart wallet for securely managing digital asset. And what makes Gnosis Safe different is that it allows you to define customized access permissions. You know, digital assets on Web3 are usually controlled by a single private key. And this is a problem because private keys can get lost or compromised. And on top of that, users have to trust individuals holding single private keys to govern highly valuable digital assets or protocols. Gnosis Safe enables users to control digital assets with much more granular permissions. This could involve multiple private keys, a subset of which is required for executing a transaction. These keys can be stored on different hardware or software wallets or even shared across multiple people. And also, custom permission modules can be added to enable even more use cases like setting transfer allowances for individual keys or automatically executing transactions decided by a snapshot community vote. Gnosis Safe's extra layer of security and personalization makes it the most trusted Web3 asset management solution for individuals, teams, and DAOs who already use it to store more than $57 billion worth of fungible digital assets today. And also, it can store and manage NFTs. On top of that, Gnosis Safe also provides lots of opportunities for developers to plug into the platform Developers can extend the Gnosis Safe interface with their own dApps and even build additional permission modules. The ecosystem of safe apps and custom modules extends the usability of Gnosis as a portal to DeFi, financial tooling, organizational management, and beyond. Visit gnosis-safe.io to learn more and to get started with your own safe. Welcome to the Enterprise Podcast the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Sebastian Couture, and I'm here with Frederica Ernst. Today, we're speaking with Munir Benchemled, who is the founder of Paraswap. Paraswap is a uh, AMM DEX aggregator and also a sponsor of this podcast. So, um, Munir, uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Frederica, for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure having, being here. So before you founded Paraswap, uh, you know you worked at a couple of startups in France, and um, I was surprised to find out that you worked for the uh, Paris Metro System, and you worked also, I think, for SNCF, which is the the French railway, and you worked at like several other startups as well. And uh, I, I found that it was kind of interesting as a background for someone who you know came into DeFi around 2017, 2018. You also co-founded DeFi France, which is uh, like a sort of association here in France that has grown to you know, several hundred members and has produced really great content, I think, educating people about DeFi and they do like meetups and things like that. And has been, I, I feel like, kind of instrumental to um, a lot of the projects that we're now seeing come out of France. So you know, tell us a bit about your journey and you know, what brought you to uh, you know, co-found DeFi France and then eventually uh, found Paraswap. Yeah, actually, I have uh, most, I would say, of my time of my career, uh, I worked in the transportation industry. That's what you saw with the, the French railway station, a railway company and Metro. Uh, I worked also at a competitor of Uber. Uh, it was also here in Paris. And I, meanwhile, mean working at those companies, I've been connected to the crypto ecosystem. Uh, I started with Bitcoin in 2012, the first time, and especially in 2013, when I started really, uh, I would say, embracing the philosophy behind the Bitcoin and crypto. And until 2017, this is where I went straight uh, into crypto and was doing almost exclusively crypto content. Actually, I left my job uh, just to build something on crypto. At the time, I didn't have any idea on what to do exactly. I just was sure. I was just sure that uh, it's in crypto uh, what I want to build uh, something or maybe join a company. Uh, it took me some time until 2019. This is where I started Paraswap and the rest is history. What made you decide to start um, a DEX aggregator? Because, um, I, I mean, even at the time, there were already DEX aggregators around, right? So in 2019, there was uh, only one at the time, maybe two, actually. And the idea came before those two appear. I was a user of Ethel Data and uh, during the ICO craze, actually, that was the best place uh, where we can find liquidity for those ICO tokens. And the initial idea was to build a better version of Ethel Delta. 
because it was good. Uh, I mean, it was serving its purpose, but the user experience was not great. It was too slow, uh, too expensive, especially with gas at the time. And the idea was to build a DEX that is just better than Ethel Delta. And that was late 2018. And there was some some histories with Ethel Delta at the time. So, uh, which, and at the same time, there was Uniswap, Kyber, and Bancor that started having some traction relative to that period. I mean, that period was making $1 million a day was something huge. And uh, so I said, let's not maybe build uh, a DEX because there are maybe very interesting products. Let's gather the liquidity of all those DEXs into a single place uh, so that the end users will have access to a higher liquidity. So that was the initial idea. I mean, the, the second iteration, sorry. And during that time, I saw two products that were launched. Uh, one, of, one of them is called Total. Uh, I think it still, is, still exists. And that was the first aggregator. Then they came one inch. And for me, it was great because, uh, I mean, I was I thought I had this idea first, but other people had it and implemented it. So which means it's a kind of a market validation for, for the idea I had and launched. So I decided, in fact, to, to maybe iterate and do something different by launching a pure retail app, like something that will uh, democratize uh, DeFi and access to DEXs that anyone can use. And that was launched in June 2019. It got a lot of excitement from, from many people and a lot of good feedback. But actually, uh, nobody was literally using it. It was a very naive approach in 2019, launching a DeFi app for retail that anyone can use, which led me to iterate and build something for the DeFi community, which looks a lot like uh, what is Paraswap today. Cool. Uh, before we, we dive into Paraswap, I mean, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the, the French crypto ecosystem. We're both in France and very much involved in it uh, in various ways. And you, know, you you founded you co-founded DeFi France. You know, I mentioned earlier it's a, it's sort of a nonprofit that uh, has you know organizes meetups and produces uh, educational content uh, around DeFi. And I think like a lot of people outside France probably get you know probably have uh, interacted with the French ecosystem like through ETC. But you know how how big is the French DeFi ecosystem and like how, how do you feel like uh, DeFi France has contributed to you know, the proliferation, like there's been just so many like really interesting projects coming of France uh, in the last recent months. Like how important do you think DeFi France was to bootstrapping like the DeFi community that we have now? So DeFi France started in Q4, like around September 2019. It started by just a coincidence. Uh, there was this big DeFi group in Telegram and somebody asked a question about is someone from France here? Or like, is someone speaking French, French here? Uh, somebody replied, then somebody else replied. We were like five talking. And then we said, let's create a group. We created a group called the DeFi France. And this is where DeFi France started. Uh, we had like 30 people and very active, very highly engaged and continued growing. And then we organized the first meetup uh, in Paris. And we were highly surprised because we were expecting normally in meetups, people uh, have like 50, 60, 70% no shows. We have an excess. We have around uh, 100 and something total with 50% uh, in live stream and 80 people inside. And that was 2019 where like people were barely talking about DeFi. Uh, so this is really when DeFi front started and the engagement was until now with there is no uh, loss in like a quality. Uh, very, very highly engaging in the subject, are really, really interesting. So I think many of the projects you see today, um, I won't say they came out of DeFi France because the, DeFi France is not really an entity, but I would say they were inspired by the project and the content that was present in DeFi France. Uh, and now it's been almost two years. And I don't know if you see the, some of the projects right now that, that were launched, uh, like uh, Morpho, uh, like Paladin, like... Uh, Jellyfy. So these guys uh, were uh, very, I would say, active participants in, in DeFi France. So yeah, I, it's hard to say it came, they came from there, but I, I would I would highly give credits to the community of DeFi France to to inspire these guys to to launch uh, to launch uh, to launch this this project. It's really cool to see like all the, all this. I feel like DeFi France was you know a big inspiration to these people, and uh, I, I I give it a lot of credit for you know, um, propulsing the, the eco ecosystem here in France. So, you know, before, before we dive into Paraswap, maybe just a quick reminder for those perhaps who are, you know, tuning in for the first time here, you know, give us a sort of an overview of like, what is a DEX aggregator and what's its purpose? 
So aggregators are like uh, airline companies. That's the easiest example I, I give. It's like an Expedia or a kayak.com where it gathers its supply uh, in here in DeFi, what we call liquidity from different sources, uh, actually hundreds, maybe thousands of sources if we count the pools of each tax and tries to deliver a price that is better than the market. That's the value proposition of DAX aggregators is trying to beat the market price uh, and that's either for end users or maybe for protocol users or API users in a, in a nutshell. So currently around 20% or so of trading volume goes through DEX aggregators. The other 80% go through trading destinations directly. Why do you think that is? I would say uh, the market is still maybe not aware 100% of uh, of uh, of aggregators. Also, uh, one funny thing is that among the other volume that we count, like the other 80% contains also the volume coming from, from aggregators. So normally uh, the volume for aggregators maybe is more, more than that because they're often double counting. Like uh, a trade that was, uh, when if a trade will go through Paraswap, maybe it will touch Uniswap once or twice or three times. And Uniswap will get this volume counted three times and Paraswap will get it counted once or another aggregator. So, I would say there is part of, uh, I would say, publicity that is not uh, enough. And that's also the same thing in airline companies. Many people still go directly to Ryanair, Air France, uh, Air America, and so on. But also there is this double counting that, that's happening. Uh, so I'd say it's uh, one kind of both. And there are also many projects. Uh, they will go directly to Uniswap because it's one of the best, uh, the, sorry, the biggest uh, exchanges. So they will go straight and integrate Uniswap just because it's uh, known enough that they will go only only there and miss out on the liquidity of aggregators. So if you look at the fees that users are slapped with, I would kind of count them in three different buckets, right? So basically there's gas, then there is slippage, and then there is um, extracted MEV, right? I mean, w would you agree, Munir? Well, MEV, I mean, it's common from for all DEXs or anything that is uh, on-chain trading uh, that has maybe no native protection. We can maybe discuss more more into that. Uh, I mean, the fees, yes, they are paid uh, paid anyways. So, you know, excuse me, what was the third? The gas, you mean? The gas overhead? Yeah. yeah, that's true. So what we what we do, and I think now uh, it's becoming uh, a standard in tax aggregators is that prices will always take uh, gas into consideration. Like, uh, for instance, you are getting a thousand dollars, maybe uh, you will be getting less than one thousand, or you will be getting nine nine five nine hundred ninety five dollars uh, as our uh, destination token, um, because the one thousand will come with a higher gas. So those gas weight is taken uh, into consideration in calculating those aggregation algorithms. Uh, in order to argue that something else is we did and also other DEXs have, uh, aggregators have done is rebuilding those native routers of DEXs. Like Uniswap, they have a router. It was rebuilt by us, by others, in order to consume less gas. So ours consume 5% less gas than Uniswap V2. And we are also working on a V5 on our smart contracts that will minimize the, the overhead uh, to a, uh, I would say, few uh, 10, 10, 20, 40 K, uh, still, still I mean, on overhead, but much less given the advantage we get to using agriculture. And what do you think is the typical trade size from which it is worthwhile using a DEX aggregator instead of just a trading destination like Uniswap? Because basically, if, if you have gas overhead by going through several different smart contracts, then if, you, if you're if you only trading for, say, a thousand euros or something, it might not be worthwhile, right? Um, I would say it depends also on the gas conditions and depends on the blockchain. So if we're talking about Ethereum, in general, we, we tell users better to use DEXs in general, not only aggregators, starting from around thousand dollars. And but also that depends a lot on the gas price markets. As I said, Uniswap in all the forks are cheaper now in aggregators than on the DEXs themselves. So yeah, it depends, I would say, mostly on the market and using usage of DEXs and not only on aggregators. Do we have a sense of how much people are saving on average by using DEX aggregators? You know, like, you know, if you have to trade $500 uh, and you had the choice between a DEX going straight to the DEX or the DEX aggregator, 
you know, how much can people expect to to save, like to optimize like their their trade there? What are the gains that they can expect? So it depends. There are two categories. There is the long tail and high cap tokens. Uh, so the high cap, in general, it's a couple of say 05 percent or less than point five percent for small amounts. For a high amount, like more than one billion dollars, it can range over one one two percent. Depends on on the liquidity. Uh, for low cap uh, or the long tail, uh, it depends. Most of the long tail are in a single dex. So for a five hundred dollars. I would say 90% of the cases, it will be on a single DEX, on a Uniswap, for instance. And our uh, selling, uh, unique selling value proposition is uh, go use as instead of Uniswap because our uh, our DEX is cheaper than Uniswap in terms of gas. So I would say, yes, I would classify them in two categories. Uh, if it's a low cap, maybe $500 to $1,000 will, will still make sense. But in this case, we're looking into gas, uh, gas and in high cap or maybe high high. Uh, volume or like high high amounts this is where we're going to be looking at the percentage on how, how much an aggregator is better than native but native texts it's always good to compare many users what they will are doing is they are opening literally multiple uh, tag tabs in in their in their uh, google chrome or whatever they're using and comparing those uh, that's why we have a table like instead of people doing that we can show them the prices in a single table so that they can compare themselves and see which one is best Hmm, interesting. So w- one of the things that I, th- I think people are used to seeing on a DEX aggregator is like the router, but I'm, I'm not like particularly familiar about how that works, like what the router actually does. So can you explain like what is the, the router and like what role it plays in the trade? So router is, well, there are two things. There is the algorithm part. So like the data side that will run the algorithm and gives the user a price and that is uh, as good as the best price of the market or better than the markets and there's the second part that is the execution which is the smart contract or the set of smart contracts that will execute this trade so if you look at the first part which is the routing side or like the algorithm side uh, so there is a lot of uh, engineering and algorithms uh, that are involved like a cocktail of algorithms that are involved in order to maximize the price and minimize the fees which are, that are the gas here and that uses uh, I would say well we can get into the details but as I said a, a set of algorithms and also it's we try to uh, have a real-time connections to the liquidity and that's what the liquidity which means we are connected to the full nodes and try to source prices as fast as possible in order to stay connected to the markets and the execution side is smart contracts that will execute on multiple DEXs and make sure the prices that are returned uh, matches the expectation of the users. Otherwise, it will revert. So it's an atomic trade. It will either 100% execute or or fully revert, and the users will get back their funds. And that's a guarantee that the EVM uh, are, is giving to the user. So what are the challenges of running a DEX aggregators? I would say there are many uh, because there's a lot of engineering complexity on the backend side. But the biggest challenge is staying synchronized with the liquidity of the blockchain because there's a lot of data. Uh, If you look at our traffic, we are doing hundreds of calls per second. If you look at our our backend system, we are making thousands or tens of thousands sometimes of calls uh, per second. It's, uh, It's very high traffic. It looks a little bit like... It wasn't like that, but right now it looks more and more like traditional finance. Uh, I mean, a lot of computations all, in all the time, a lot of engineering strategies in order to deliver high consistency. And that's not an option to deliver inconsistent prices. So I would say this is the first uh, and major part. And obviously, like any DeFi protocol, uh, security is always the main concern on trying to deliver smart contracts that are secure because, I mean, people, if they execute the trade on our smart contract, we have literally no control. So these things have to be highly secure, highly audited, and the engineering practices have to be done very well. So let's let's talk about governance a little bit. Before doing this interview, you know, I posted on Twitter that we were going to be speaking with you and you know, asked what we should ask as a question. And a vast majority of people uh, were interested in knowing if, uh, if Paraswap would have a token soon. And other DEX aggregators have issued a token, uh, either in the form of an airdrop or like some other distribution methods. And these tokens are typically for governance. So tell us a little bit about 
like why a DEX aggregator would have a token and if this is something that you guys are uh, considering since there seems to be so much enthusiasm about a, a potential Paraswap token. Yeah, the famous uh, when token. So I would say yes, the answer, the short answer is yes. Uh, but the, I would say the motivations are not necessarily the same as you may have seen in other aggregators. Uh, some aggregators were a pivot from a non-performing project to to an aggregator. Uh, some some others had also AMMs, and the main use case was the, the AMM, and then uh, other use cases show up, which are also interesting. Um, for us, and our vision is building a DeFi project or a DeFi protocol, uh, is, it, it means decentralization. So um, it, building, uh, I would say, a centralized UI, centralized backend, is just a mean to an end, and not the end itself. Maybe that's uh, what my feeling I have for some other project. That's um, it's very important to keep, uh, I say, a, a intellectual property on some of the things that have been built. But for us, the future, uh, everything has to be decentralized, and we should be able to literally raise our hands and this thing continue to work. Parasop as a tech should continue to work. Maybe Parasop.io, which is a domain name that uses legacy uh, tech systems, maybe it will. Decentralized. I mean, we have no choice right now, but the tech itself, the smart contracts, the the backend, and all the tech should be decentralized. And to do that in a secure way, uh, and also in an incentivizing way, that needs some incentive mechanisms. So that's why a token will make sense. Uh, when this will happen, we don't have a date yet. If it will happen only when we get there, I don't have an answer right now, uh, but uh, we are working into on a very creative models in order to make this thing, uh, I would say, uh, useful. And I, for me, a token is not also a, an end, it's also a mean to an end because it's a tool that helps on maximizing decentralization or solving some product problems right now that we have identified. And I will have some information maybe in the next few weeks or next few months. You can say when exactly, uh, but we were working on some very interesting... Tw- I don't know if the Twitter mobs will be satisfied with that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but yeah. <laughs> well, actually, so w- when you were talking about this, it kind of brought up some some other things that uh, I'm I'm interested in picking your brain on. So you mentioned that you know the DeFi, the the, the back end, you know, would um, need to be decentralized, and that that's kind of the goal. And that the front ends, uh, you know, there could be a website or something like that. And you know, recently there was a bit of uproar when um, when Uniswap. Uh, you know, delisted some tokens and, you know, people started kind of like raising their hands up and saying like, yeah, we need to like decentralize all front ends, et cetera. And um, what, what are your thoughts on this? Like, do you think that it's, it's like really important for also like all the front ends to be decentralized or, sh- you know, should there be companies kind of running those? And you know, what are the, some of the best technologies that are available today for this to happen? Or, you know, what things are you, you know, even if they're not mature, like which technologies are you most uh, excited about in terms of like being able to also decentralize you know front end stuff so i think it's hard to decentralize front end today uh but while keeping a high quality of service uh because we can use services like ens and so on but there is no uh the tooling that we have in web 2.0 uh you know for content delivery networks and uh, caching and all those systems uh, still are lacking there are some bridges uh like one is used by cloudflare uh, that can bring Web 2.0 toolings into uh, IPFS, um, but still also not all browsers have support for IPFS domains. Still, we will be going through Web 2.0 again. So the point is, is we are always coming back to Web, point, web, point, web 2.0, and we are still having to open an account and put a credit card and pay a Cloudflare or an equivalent. So it's hard to be a pure uh, or a purist uh, decentralized right now today. But there are some features who are like some products who are building. I forget the names, but some interesting ones. And that's one part, like the delivery part. There is another part is building the software itself. When we build the software with the team, we have a GitHub that is centralized. We have uh, the whole process of building. Uh, we are a small team, so we have, I don't know, depending on each team, like we have a Scrum Master, a product manager, and so on. And We do that to keep things efficient. By decentralizing, it's very hard to have good consensus 
Um, and that's also, again, talking about purism in decentralization. But we can, I think, I always think that we can have pragmatism in decentralization. And that's what made many projects successful while being sufficiently decentralized. So how we do it ourselves, I'm not sure yet. So right now it's much more productive to keep things the old way until we reach a critical mass in terms of usage, in terms of maybe decentralizing what we can be decentralized today and can be efficiently decentralized, like our smart contract system, uh, bars of pooling, all, all those things. And once we reach that, maybe at that time, the tooling or the infrastructure for decentralizing the front end uh, will, be, will be mature enough to, to decentralize the front end. Running a DEX can be, how do I put this delicately, regulatorily fraud. Is it also difficult to run a DEX aggregator from a legal point of view? Or, or do you guys just take, take the stance that basically the only service you guys are providing is telling people, you know, where they can trade and you're not actually facilitating the trading yourself? Yeah, I see it personally. I mean, I'm not a legal. I mean, legal, legal is my, not my expertise. Uh, I can say only my opinion. Uh, I think it's a pure software because the liquidity is not on Paraswap, it's not on the aggregator. The liquidity is on the underlying DEX. The tokens are not listed in Paraswap, are listed on the underlying DEXs. So in my opinion, if there are any, uh, any, any uh, regulatory, I would say, challenges will happen first on DEXs and not on aggregators. It's also the case in traditional finance where middlewares, uh, like they, they call them in also what, like how we'd like to see ourselves as a middleware, uh, are not subject to the same regulations and sometimes are not to no regulations at all uh, compared to the venues where the trading happens. Because the problem is in centralized finance, there are many middlewares. I mean, there are, if, they will, if each one of them will be regulated, it's just not, not going to be possible. So that's why the regulation happened on the both ends, on the front end and on the back end side, uh, which is the trading venue and the end user interface or the broker in the case of, of DeFi. Maybe front ends uh, will have some challenges in the future. But again, I mean, I have no legal expertise. I can't really say what's going to happen. Sure. How does, how does Paraswap currently make money? So right now, by default, the Parasop is free. It doesn't have any fees or any extra fees. Uh, there are two models, two business models that were deployed in production right now. Uh, one of them is what you call performance fees. And that's a very minimal. I mean, I even have a hard time calling it a fee because it's less than a one basis point. It's just a break-even fee to just finance, I would say, whatever infrastructure is uh, behind, the, behind the API. And that's 50%. We share the, um, I would say, the upside with the end users in case they receive more than expected. And the second one is with partners. So anyone will integrate our API. If they choose to, they cannot choose to. Uh, if they want to monetize, we share fees with partners. So it's 15% for whatever fees they set. They can put them to 1%, 2%, 3%, whatever they want, even to 0%. We are totally agnostic. And we take a, a, sh a share for those fees. So when you say integration partners, like uh, who do you have in mind here? Uh, Argent, uh, Ledger, uh, MetaMask, and all of those who choose to monetize. But we have a lot who haven't monetized at all, like uh, uh, Bacowswap uh, is one of them, uh, that choose to not extract value because value also can be extracted in many ways. And each uh, product have their own uh, method or like their own approach of extracting fees. Hmm. Uh, so I, I wanted to come back to something that I noticed that I didn't I didn't ask, but when we were talking earlier about the uh, about about fees, you, you you announced earlier this year that you had released this uh, Redux token, which claims that it can reduce gas fees by up to fifty percent. How does that work? Well, it used to work because uh, now with the London hard fork, uh, it's no longer usable because uh, there was a change in the EVM. And the uh, gas tokens, are ours, I mean, our previous like, uh, Redux and others are no longer possible. And basically the concept was uh, if you remove storage from the blockchain, you get refunds in order to incentivize people to remove storage. And the, the idea was interesting, but many people started abusing between codes like us uh, at, uh, at, some, at some way to create an artificial uh, storage by smart contracts and uh, when the gas was was cheap and removing the storage when the gas was high it's like an, it was like 
in arbitrage in order to reduce gas fees. It was very useful with, when gas was very expensive. But yeah, right now it's no longer possible. Thank you, Vitalik. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that, that certainly. I mean, in, in the grand scheme of things, it was probably good uh, that this move happened because people were abusing it. And basically the way that it was in, basically wasn't used in the way that it was envisaged to be used. So, uh, yeah. Um, so maybe let's talk about the DeFi ecosystem as, it, you know, as a larger arena. What we currently see is um, trading sizes being economically limited on layer one, right? So basically, uh, back in the day, you could, you know, send $10 worth of something and, you know, it cost like 10 cents. It was fine. And now that trades have become much more expensive, the economic viability has kind of gone down for these smaller trades. So basically, they get pushed to layer two. What what are your thoughts on the dynamics uh, between layer one and layer two and um, uh, with regards to trading? How do you see this interplay in an equilibrium state in, say, a year or two? Yeah, maybe a year can be a little bit easy to predict. Uh, more than that, it's very hard. I mean, even one year is a bit challenging. So right now we saw the big success of sidechains, which are not layer twos. But maybe they, what they have in common with layer twos is high throughputs in low fees, and they attracted a significant amount of retail, which uh, were starting becoming to start to lose at some point in DeFi from say DeFi summer uh, till the launch of BSC. Uh, pretty much, uh, it was kind of exclusively DeFi digital play uh, using taxes and aggregators and other other DeFi platforms. So. I would say uh, we have a clear sign that layer twos are and will continue uh, including uh, the retail. And right now it's hard to, to say if we look at that layer twos as proper layer twos, like ZK Rollups, Optimistic Rollups, and not the uh, side chains and how this, this would play out. We will see, but I think uh, it will be also one of the biggest engines of driving retail. I'm hesitating a bit because what I saw and what drove uh, a lot of interest is all those incentives we were seeing in those side chains. So I think that uh, for layer two to succeed to attract uh, users, there has to be some kind of incentive, like some kind of high, highly attractive product for this for these people to come and uh, leave uh, the side chains and go for layer twos. We want them to do so, in my opinion, because it's it's much more secure and they rely on the security on Ethereum. Uh, but in order to do so. There has to be this incentive because the security incentive is not enough for retail because simply there is lack of understanding of those uh, properties. Yeah, interesting. C can you maybe explain how you differentiate layer two and side chains? So what to you is the core? Is, is to you a layer two something that sh shares the economic um, guarantees of, of Ethereum layer one or how do you how are they connected? Yeah, for me, layer two uh, relies on the existence of Ethereum. Like the, it cannot exist without uh, without Ethereum. And a side chain uh, is just an L1 that has either compatibility uh, with, with Ethereum, like Polygon, for instance. Smart co the smart contract, the trans here would run there, but it has its own security uh, assumptions and it's completely independent. It's like a Solana, for instance, it's a layer one. It says that it's not a sidechain because it's not compatible with Ethereum in terms of EVM and so on. Ah, okay. And do, do you think that um, the likes of um, Polygon and, uh, say, XDAI um, can, um, that, that you would characterize as, as sidechains, um, do you think they can somehow attract the security guarantees that Ethereum Layer 1 currently affords? Or, I mean... It, it doesn't have to be the exact same security guarantees, right? Basically, they just have to be commensurate with um, the use case. Yeah, I think um, they, it doesn't have to be, of course, and it can be also as good as Ethereum if it's uh, done in a different way. I mean, wh why not? I think some, and that's something we started to see, like Polygon with the merge uh, with Hermes, uh, maybe they are building something uh, more solid than what exists right now. I mean, they have to start somewhere. They don't need to have full 
bulletproof security from from day one. They made the, they choose to get the traction, and now they are maybe building new models that are more solid than what existed before. It, also, the same thing with Ethereum. It's uh, each year it's more and more solid. So I think uh, Polygon will will get there at some point. Cool. What 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 do you think is currently missing in the in the Ethereum DeFi ecosystem? It's currently missing. But I think it's broad, uh, the DeFi ecosystem. There are many, many things uh, going on. But for me, uh, maybe we, we, we come back to the same subjects. I think layer twos are missing because now Ethereum uh, is still a DeGen place and retail are going to side chains. So I think uh, layer twos will bring back Ethereum to its initial, I would say, philosophy of being inclusive and bringing, I would say, uh, yeah, maybe cliche, sounds cliche, like financial freedom to 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 everyone. How, how do you see the evolution of trading happening? So basically, if you look at um, uh, if you look at the history of DEXs on Ethereum, um, we used to have the order book DEXs, right? And then basically they were overtaken by AMMs, which in a way was unlikely because the user experience is, is worse. But the tech, basically the feasibility is better. So how do you see that play out in the long run? Will we see more and more sophisticated AMMs like Uniswap V3? Or will there be a return of um, operators uh, order book taxes? I think they will, we will continue. Uh, I mean, in this uh, direction of innovation, it doesn't have to be either or. And Uniswap V3 is the proof. It's, it's a merge between other book models and AMMs. So it has the best of both worlds, the, con the convenience of using AMM and also the sophistication of using other book. And maybe right now, uh, we, the new challenges with MEV, for instance, push the, the ecosystem for new innovations uh, like this new, uh, I, don't, I don't know what it's called, uh, like TWAP, but with an M, things like uh, AMMs that are executing trades in batches in order, but I think that's also what uh, what CalSwap is doing you know, with, with with Gnosis uh, in order to reduce to reduce MEV and maximizes the price that the user is is going to get. So I think those are new trends. It's always the case. It's not nothing is new. Like AMMs existed maybe since 2016 or early 2017 with Bancor, but only in 2019 that people started talking about it. Maybe also with uh, with batch batch executions, it was uh, it was it was pioneered by by Gnosis, and only right now people uh, it became became cool and trendy. But there is also a necessity because at, at the time there was no MEV and there were we didn't have those challenges. And right now, since we started to see them, that people notice the the benefits of using such systems. So I think yeah, the innovation is building one is building on top of the others. Uh, and hard to say what's what's gonna what's gonna show up in the future. But I think other books and AMMs and product built on top of those will continue to to I mean to innovate. I'd like to just come back to the to the discussion you were having earlier about L ones and L twos. Do you think that L twos are just destined to capture much of the liquidity that exists in L one? I mean, if if fees there are so much cheaper and transactions happen much quicker, do you think it's just natural for most of the most of like pools and uh, transaction volume to just move into L L twos? That's what we hope uh, will happen. Uh, but the, the issue uh, with that is we are creating a new problem uh, that is fra new kinds of fragmentation. We used to have it in N1s. It was solved uh, partially by aggregators as well, by gathering this, this, uh, this, uh, this fragmentation. But right now we have a new kind of fragmentation where we cannot apply the same security, I would say native security guarantees uh, provided by the same L1. Uh, so I, hard to say. Uh, if liquidity is going to be concentrated, if on a single uh, L2 or m mostly on an L2, uh, or maybe cross multiple L2s, but that again created also new opportunities for innovations by creating solid bridges that are highly secure and highly decentralized. Still, I think we are not there yet, but we see some very early, very positive early signs that some of those bridges are going to make this this possible, make this this composability that we lost the possible and, and efficient. Hmm. Do you think it will be possible to like this is something I, I was thinking about earlier? I don't know if this is possible, and maybe you guys have an answer. Let's say someone has like a 
you know, a bunch of liquidity positions on one Ether address and like they're, you know, in, uh, you know, they're in Aave and maybe they have like a CDP or something. Will it be possible to do sort of a one click migrate, you know, perhaps losing flash loans so that you could just basically move all of, all of your positions onto an L2 without having to like liquidate those positions, et cetera. And you mean across L2s? No, from, from like L1 to L2. So like, let's say you want to take advantage of, you know, something like Polygon, but um, you were already like invested in in, in an L1 uh, smart contract. Could you just simply move those positions, like do sort of like a migrate contract that would migrate all your positions onto L2 so that you can benefit from like lower fees and faster transactions? Yeah, so there are two parts of that. There is the part that is proper to L1, uh, like avoiding liquidations and so on. That's a problem that we know how to solve with the, with the tools like flash loans and so on. The challenging part is moving liquidity to the other side and making all this process atomic. So that's what we lose. And maybe in L1, uh, we lose the synchronous atomicity. Like we are 100% sure that will this fully succeed or fully reverts. But the thing here is that this, uh, ato- I would say, uh, synchronous atomicity that uh, was lost. Uh, I mean, there's no way to, to have it. So. Uh, there are ways, but they are not 100% central, uh, decentralized. Uh, there are some trade-offs, and that's, I mean, anyways, it's about engineering. It's all about making trade-offs and making the right trade-offs and building on top of what has been what has been done. So there are solutions like Connect that will allow you to programmatically do this where, by um, executing smart contract on the one side, uh, moving the funds to the other side, and executing the contract on the other side again. So you will uh, say you have DAI on Aave and you borrowed USDT. It's gonna pay back your loan and take out the DAI, move the DAI to say, I don't know, Arbitrum for instance, and then it's gonna deposit the DAI again, Arbitrum, and, uh, deposit the DAI on Arbitrum and borrow the USDT. All of this is the same smart contract at the end. If you, if you look at it, it's just the instructions we are giving to the smart contracts. But the question here is who is doing this work? I mean, somebody has to push a button and has to do it. Um, and you can, as a user, initiate the first the first transaction, but then moving the funds to from L1 to Arbitrum. Um, well, in, in Connect, they are using market makers uh, who the system is still not custodial, but they are responsible for this operation. So there is an execution trust. We are trusting that they will execute your transaction in time and they will put your funds on the other side in time. So that's... I would say the only trade-off that exists in other projects, they try to build different models, like instead of using market makers, they will use oracles and validators of the oracles, like Chainlink. We don't know which who has who is right because none of this is highly battle tested, but the idea seems quite seem quite interesting. Super interesting. So one of the other hot topics um, of the moment is MEV, right? So basically, and if you look at DEX aggregators like Paraswap. They offer um, MEV protection against some sorts of any MEV, right? So basically um, against backrunning, for instance, but not quite as uh, well on uh, front running and sandwiching. Do you have plans to kind of protect your users against these kinds of attacks? Uh, yeah, well, there are m- m- multiple things uh, that can be done here. Well, first of all, on the front end side, where users don't need to broadcast the transaction uh, to the miners, like to the call, what you call the, uh, the dark forest, uh, they can send it to uh, specific networks like flashbots, uh, like blocks route, and so on. So that's 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 better. But there's CalSwap uh, also that's uh, doing uh, this batch processing, which is very helpful. But then also there are native products that are MEV resistant, like Parasoft Pool, which is a network of uh, professional market makers. It's like an on-chain OTC trading and the codes are fixed as OTC. I mean, I'm selling X and expecting Y, and that Y is fixed as long as it executed on time. So that's uh, natively what we're doing, but that's only one of the DEXs among others. That if 100% of the trade is executed on Parasoft pool, there is literally no possibility to have any slippage or any kind of front-running attack, but the users can do it themselves and we can help them by integrating these kinds of features on the UI side, like flashbots, uh, like limits all the sweet swap, uh, blocks route, and that's another, another truth. So as we wrap up here, I wanted to uh, maybe take a step back a little bit and um, you know look at the DeFi ecosystem uh, from a broader perspective. What are your thoughts on the institutionalization of DeFi? You know, do you think it'll happen? 
And perhaps more importantly, do you think it'll happen on Ethereum or perhaps some other platform? Well, it's definitely already happening, as we saw with Aave and Aave Pro. And uh, whether it's Ethereum or not, I think so. Because uh, institutions are interested normally, what, I'm, what I can see in two things. Uh, first is in the liquidity and there is in DeFi, in the returns that DeFi can provide to them. And the second thing on the technology. And both are built on Ethereum. Uh, so if it's not on Ethereum, it will be on a fork of Ethereum. So it depends on the motivations of the institutions. If it's just about technology, so it may be on a private fork of Ethereum, which is still, I mean, credit to Ethereum. Uh, if it's uh, about liquidity, so it should happen on mainnet, and if it's not on mainnet, on a layer two. So I would say very, very likely that this will be on Ethereum. We see, see some innovation also on Solana, on Polkadot, but Ethereum has the critical mass. I mean, has the, the lion's share of, of this. And I would see institutions starting with Ethereum, the old Ethereum ecosystem, rather than going for, for other, other blockchains. Hmm. Do you think that, like... Uh... Efficient and secure bridges, you know, could potentially you know lead institutions to, at least, uh, I mean, you know, perhaps Ethereum is you know the platform where most of this happens. But what role do bridges play in making it such that other platforms can other also capture uh, some of the activity? Well, also, uh, I would always uh, put that uh, re relative to the motivations. Uh, so if it's uh, and also on the amounts that are at stake. So I would, I would say it's very hard to, to know right now. Uh, it's still in the beginning. Uh, we, in Ave, maybe it's a good it's a good project to watch and see the outcome on how this will play. But uh, institutions are security for institutions something very important because what is at stake is is very high. So. I don't know. I mean, hard to know. If for me, it will be either Ethereum or a private blockchain because it's given these institutions a, uh, a insurance that things will be safer. So yeah, I don't. I don't know uh, how how it will play exactly, but yeah, I see hardly them using something besides Ethereum or private blockchains. Do you think um, institutional money is gonna change what DeFi currently is? Yeah, I mean, about, uh, I, I can't really say, but uh, what we can make a parallel with the CBDCs uh, they are try that are trying to run on blockchains, and some of them are considering public blockchains. Uh, what I heard, at least in France, uh, they are considering all blockchains. I mean, they are not going for a single one. They are testing each and every major, major blockchain in order to figure out which one would work best. But... Uh, this is the, um, I mean, I would say the biggest, uh, biggest players like states and governments. Um, in any ways, this will be highly centralized. So it's not going to be DeFi. Maybe we don't even know that uh, if DeFi users will even have access to this money that normally is, is reserved for banks and high in big institutions. So, yeah, I, I mean, I still, I mean, it's not my expertise. I, I can't, I can't say exactly, but, um, if DeFi will change how the perception of money uh, for people, that I can definitely say yes. Are, are you afraid of um, the regulatory landscape and where it's currently headed in Europe? Not, not, uh, not, not afraid at all, because uh, we had some discussions with uh, many regulators in many countries. The common denominator with all of them is that they are all pro-innovation uh, and they like to talk to builders and they would like to see more builders. Uh, the only thing is uh, how DeFi fits into the current regulatory frameworks, uh, which I think it doesn't. So the challenge is how will the future regulations look like that will try to regulate DeFi. And uh, now what I like is that uh, regulators understand very well how DeFi, at least the ones we talk to, maybe uh, we haven't seen the whole, the whole, uh, the whole picture, but the ones we talk to and we see in multiple countries, they like innovation, but they are still, uh, I would say, uh, those institutions are very complex and uh, have a different agenda than builders. I mean, they have protection, uh, human protection uh, rules, anti-money laundering, and so on. So how will this look like? I don't think it will be as bad as people think, but I definitely think it will be very highly challenging.
Yeah, I mean, this is a, a topic that uh, I'm personally very invested in and, and interested about uh, working at Adan and everything. And I, I feel that at one point it will actually come to a head because the agendas are so different. And I, I really think that at the moment, the builders and the ins- and the regulators are not putting really all their cards on the table. Like the builders are trying to convince regulators that what they're doing is like you know innovative and everything. But what I think institutions you know, f- um, fail to fully grasp is that crypto and DeFi is a, is a power play. I mean, it's, it's fundamentally there to disrupt, you know, s- um, central concentrations of power and, you know, whether, whether that becomes apparent to regulators before they regulate crypto or, you know, it kind of like comes up after, you know, will like, one one side of this fight is going to get um it, it will you know will be disappointed <laughs> and, and i i have a feeling that the regulators uh with the power that they do have will probably ha- end up having the upper hand and you know we might end up with like a future of defi that looks a lot more like spotify and netflix than BitTorrent, and you know which which has its advantages and you know like uh still allows like innovation to foster and everything but like a sort of wild west world where you know the future of finance and like world you know global economies are governed by you know shadowy supercoders i think is unlikely i don't know if you have any, anything to to add to that or if any, any reactions to that at all yeah i i i cannot agree with you in that sense i mean the world will always have some order in one way or the other and maybe human beings uh, expect to have this predictability uh than not having any kind of visibility on who has control of what. So maybe it's not going to look like this, but DeFi, again, is very small and the use cases are very limited today. And the disrupting and changing completely the financial system is not on the table here. It's more what is on the table right now for builders is just making things better, just making exchange of value better, uh, just making exchange of digital value better. That is the, the order of today uh, right now. And I think no matter what happened, as you said, we will have the Netflix and, and Amazon Primes and so on for sure. Uh, but whether we will have very sophisticated BitTorrents that will be uh, more and more established, I think that we will have it as well because the blockchains right now, and especially Ethereum and maybe Bitcoin as well, are hard to, I mean, cannot be stopped. And what's built on top of those cannot be stopped. So maybe other people who didn't have access to finance before will always have this kind of access. And that I think is, is irreversible. Mm. So what projects are you most interested about today? Like what really kind of gets you excited uh, in the DeFi space right now? Like what's at the f- kind of at the cusp or at the forefront of innovation? Well, maybe we, we discuss it layer twos, but also bridges with layer twos. Those are things I'm looking at. Not looking too much in NFTs. I don't know how, but uh, maybe too too focused on what uh, what we're doing. We actually had some, probably a good idea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I had some cool ideas about NFTs, but since we're not really highly involved, we didn't have the time to to really focus uh, focus on them. But always ideas in the aggregation side. I mean, that's what, what we do. So, so that's what we've been, we've been thinking, thinking about. But I think the biggest uh, things that are happening today, in my opinion, the most interesting things that are happening is those connections between uh, blockchains and between layer twos that I think is very challenging in an intellectual point of view and also in a kind of uh, user demand point of view. Yeah, I agree. I think like Creating the bridges here is one of the most important things. Like you want to have, I, I think we, we want a future where you know, assets and liquidity can just move pretty flawlessly, you know, pretty seamlessly between platforms and like even, you know, between like layer one. So, you know, like having assets being able to move from Ethereum to Solana or, or Cosmos. And I think is a vision of blockchain that I've always kind of you know, been excited about. And I, I, I'm hoping that it, really goes in that direction that we do have like true interoperability between everything so yeah that's that's also something i'm very very interested in seeing happening and playing out yeah munir thanks so much for joining us today for coming on the podcast and uh telling us about paraswap and your you know your vision for DeFi. and uh yeah looking forward to seeing where the, the continued growth of paraswap well thank you for having me it was a pleasure being here it was a pleasure to have you on Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, 
or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.